the causes of sin. In this video, we'll be looking at malice, ignorance, and weakness. These are the three causes of sin, according to St. Thomas Aquinas. Sin presents for us a paradox in human psychology. The fact that people commit sins, that is, voluntarily do things that are bad, is obvious. Nevertheless, this obvious fact also seems to present us with a problem, or a paradox. In order to do something voluntarily, we have to want it. But we only want things because they are good. The will is a rational appetite. Therefore, by nature, the will can only incline towards what the intellect judges to be good. Willing evil as such is impossible. So if sins are evil actions, how is it possible that anyone ever wants to sin? And if people don't want to sin, but sins must be voluntary to be sins, then how is it possible that sins ever occur? To answer this question, let's take a step back from moral faults, which are what we usually mean by the word sin, and simply consider the cause of sins in general, sins taken in the technical sense of the word. In another video, we distinguish between the technical meaning of the word sin and moral fault, which is what we usually mean when we say sin. Technically speaking, sin is any defective action. Moral fault is a special kind of sin which is both voluntary and contrary to the moral law. A bird growing a wing that is too short to be used for flight is a sin in the technical sense, but not in the ordinary way in which we use the word. Likewise, a human tripping or hobbling with a broken leg is a sin in the technical sense, but not in the ordinary sense we use the word. Likewise, a painter choosing to make an ugly painting is a sin in the technical sense, but not in the ordinary sense. But none of these above sins is a moral fault. That is, none of these falls within the category of what we normally mean by sin. Because none of these is both A, voluntary, and B, against the moral law. Some of them are voluntary, but not all of them, or none of them, are voluntary and against the moral law. Studying sin in the technical sense can be helpful for learning things about moral fault, which is a special kind of sin in the technical sense. In other words, the ordinary way we use the word sin is a special kind of the technical sense of the word sin, which applies to such things as birds growing wings which are too short for flight. Take the sin of hobbling with a broken leg. This is obviously not a moral fault. It is a sin according to the technical meaning of the word, but it is not a sin in the way we usually mean that word, namely for moral faults. Here's the question. What is the cause of this non-moral sin? The answer is that there are two things to consider in the act of hobbling with a broken leg. The first thing is the positive aspect, namely the positive activity of walking. The second thing to consider is the negative aspect, the inordinateness or awkwardness of the walking. This is not something positive in reality, but something negative, a lack or absence of due order in the walking. Corresponding to these two aspects, there are two causes of the sin of hobbling with a broken leg. First, there is the locomotive power, which causes the activity of walking. This is the bodily power by which we're able to move our extremities. The second cause is the broken leg. Now, two, by itself, would not result in hobbling. Rather, hobbling only results from the locomotive power using a broken leg. Therefore, the root cause of, sin, of the sin of hobbling is really this, the locomotive power as it is using a broken leg. So there's two aspects. There's the brokenness of the leg, and then there's the loco locomotive power. You can't have one or the other and still have the results of hobbling with a, with a broken leg. But when you have both of these causes coordinated with one another, the locomotive power as using a broken leg, then the result is hobbling. <laughs> 
Suppose there is a tree with artificially bent branches. This again is a sin in the technical sense, but obviously not a moral fault, just like hobbling with a broken leg. There are again two aspects of the tree's action of growing crookedly. The positive aspect of the action, which is the activity of growing at all, and the negative aspect of the action, which is the lack of straightness in the growth. Corresponding to these two aspects are again two causes that have to be coordinated with one another. The first cause is the positive cause. There is the positive aspect, the activity of growth, which is caused by the augmentative power. This is the power which adds quantity to a certain living organism. The second cause is the cause of the absence of straightness. The absence of straightness in growth is caused by the gardeners tying the branches to the ground with strong cords. But merely tying the branches down with cords would not result in crooked branches unless the augmentative power simultaneously caused the branches to grow. Therefore, once again, we can say that the root cause of the branches growing crookedly is this, namely the coordination of two causes. The augmentative power acting on branches tied down with cords. You can't have the, the resulting defective action or sin unless you have both the action of the augmentative power, which is something positive, as well as the, the defect, namely the fact that the branches have been tied down by the gardener. Just as in the sins we've just considered, which are not moral faults, so too in moral faults, which are a special kind of sin, there are two aspects to consider. One, some positive action, or lack thereof, and two, the inordinateness, or defectiveness, of that positive action. Now, all moral faults are voluntary actions. Therefore, the cause of one, that is, of the positive action component of the moral fault, is always the power of will. In other words, just as the locomotive power is the efficient cause of the boy who hobbles, and the augmentative power is the cause of the trees growing crookedly, so too the will is the efficient cause of all moral faults. Now, what is the cause of the inordinateness or defectiveness of human action, in virtue of which human action is not only a human action, but a sinful one? To answer this, we need to first ask what the cause of order in human action is. The will is the rational appetite. All acts of will follow upon the intellect what the intellect perceives to be good or desirable. Therefore, what gives the will its order is the intellect's knowledge. Therefore, the cause of disorder in the will is the lack of knowledge or consideration in the intellect. But the intellect simply not knowing something or not considering something would not result in moral fault by itself. For instance, while sleeping or driving, you may not actually be considering the moral law, but that doesn't mean that you are therefore committing a moral fault. Rather, the root cause of moral fault is this, the will acting without the intellect first knowing or considering what is good, that is, the moral law. Since the overall consideration of what is good with respect to the ultimate end is called the rule of reason, we can say that the root cause of moral fault is this, the will acting without the intellect first considering the rule of reason. Now, since the will is the rational appetite, we can, one cannot will anything at all unless the intellect first considers that thing to be good. So there cannot be acts of will without any consideration at all on the part of the intellect. Therefore, moral fault does not depend on a total absence of consideration on the part of the intellect. Rather, it depends on the intellect not considering the rule of reason. As we discussed in the video on the definition and varieties of law, the law, especially the moral law, is the rule of reason.
Therefore, we can say that every moral fault of any kind begins in a certain sort of ignorance, that is, a lack of knowledge on the part of the intellect. But of course, if one is simply ignorant of what is right and wrong, then one is not culpable for the resulting defective action. So the action cannot be considered a moral fault. Therefore, every moral fault results not from complete ignorance about right and wrong, but rather from someone who habitually knows what is right and wrong, but fails to actually consider what is known by him. By comparison, you may know that 5 times 6 equals 30, but not actually be considering this knowledge, at least until I mentioned it. You have habitual knowledge of this truth, so you are not totally or completely ignorant of it. But since you aren't actually considering the truth, you habitually know at the moment, you are in a sense ignorant of the truth that 5 times 6 equals 30. So there's two senses of ignorance. There's complete ignorance, where you don't even habitually know something, and then there's ignorance in a sense, where you're ignoring something that you do in fact habitually know. It is the latter sort of ignorance, that is a failure to actually consider what is habitually known to be true, which lies at the root cause of moral fault. Moral fault is an action or inaction proceeding from the will when the will fails to consider what the intellect habitually knows about the moral law or rule of reason. Moral fault, as we said on the last slide, is an action or inaction proceeding from the will when the will fails to consider what the intellect habitually knows about the moral law or rule of reason. Okay, so all moral fault comes from A, the will, and B, a sort of ignorance in which we fail to consider what we habitually know in the intellect. This is the general cause of moral fault. Every sin, that is, every moral fault, has this as its cause. But particular sins have a more particular cause. Some result from the passions, or emotions. These are called, in a te technical expression, sins of weakness. You'll want to remember this title. Sins of weakness are sins resulting from the passions or emotions. A second kind of cause of sin is ignorance. We'll discuss each of these in their in turn later. Some sins result in a particular way from a special kind of ignorance. These are called sins of ignorance. Now we just said that all sins result from ignorance in general, but there's a particular way in which sins can result from a particular kind of ignorance, and we'll discuss that later. The third cause of sin is malice, or bad habits. So these sins are called sins of malice. So we have three particular causes of sin, weakness, ignorance, and malice. We'll discuss each of these in turn. The last of these is the most grave. The first of these is the least grave, that is, the least serious. One and the same act can be caused by either passion or bad habits, depending on the circumstance. For instance, under pressure from one's boss, one may tell a lie out of weakness. Another person may simply enjoy telling lies for their own sake. The first person lies through weakness, but the second lies out of bad habit. That is, he commits a sin of malice. To understand the three particular causes of sin, weakness, ignorance, and malice, we must first look at the practical syllogism. Now, this is an important concept which is necessary for evaluating anything in the moral life. A practical syllogism is a line of reasoning that proceeds from universal rules of action to a particular choice of action. For example, Premise 1. Killing of the innocent ought not to be done. Premise 2. This action, which I'm considering, would be an act of killing the innocent. Therefore, 
this action ought not to be done. The major premise is that killing the innocent ought not to be done. This is a general or universal rule for action. It usually includes the word ought. The minor premise is this action would be an act of killing the innocent. This is a particular statement of fact about real individual things or actions. Finally, the conclusion is a singular or particular rule for action judging about what is to be done right here and now. Include, this also tends to include the word ought. For instance, this action ought not to be done, or this action ought to be done. So we have a universal premise, which is called the major premise, and then something applying uh, uh, the universal premise to particulars, and then finally the conclusion, which draws a conclusion about what we ought to do in this particular singular circumstance right here and now. Here's another example. Premise 1. This is our major premise. Idolatry ought not to be done. Premise 2. Offering incense to Caesar would be idolatry. Conclusion. Therefore, offering incense to Caesar ought not to be done. In the practical syllogism made by a moral person, both premises will be true judgments, and they will involve both the power of the intellect, which knows universal things, and the inner sense powers, which teach us about individual facts. The major premise, which is universal in nature, comes from the intellect. So what knows the major premise directly is the intellect. The minor premise comes from the inner senses, because it's the senses which are in contact with singulars or particular things around us. In particular, the estimative power is important for establishing the minor premise in a practical syllogism. Now, the conclusion uses both the intellect and the inner senses. Now, as I said above, this is how a uh, practical syllogism will look for a moral person. That is, someone who's using proper practical moral reasoning. This person will take their major premise from the intellect, which knows universals, their n minor premise from the inner senses, which know uh, particulars, and their conclusion will use both the intellect and their senses. It will be both aware of the world of particulars around you, and it will also be aware of universal nature and universal moral laws. So the example given here is an example of a moral practical syllogism. Idolatry ought not to be done. This is known by the intellect. Offering incense to Caesar would be idolatry. This is known uh, primarily by the inner senses, but also involving the intellect. And then finally the conclusion, therefore offering incense to Caesar ought not to be done. This involves both the intellect and the inner senses working with each other in a proper, orderly way. Now let's look at a sin of weakness. In sins of weakness, the universal premise that reason would provide is replaced by a quasi-universal premise coming from our bodily appetites, not from the intellect. So as we saw above, in a moral person, the major premise comes from the intellect. But in sins of weakness, the major premise is now coming from the passions, or the appetites. We fail to consider the moral law that we habitually know because, being ruled by our passions, we do not want to consider anything such as morals, which may get in the way of achieving what we desire. Let's look at an example uh, from King Herod killing John the Baptist. After his daughter performed a dance, he offered her whatever she wanted. She asked for the head of John the Baptist, and Herod was too weak to say no to his beautiful daughter. The practical syllogism that Herod should have used is this. Killing the innocent ought not to be done. This is the major premise, and it's taken from the intellect. The intellect knows this moral rule is universal, that killing ought not to be done. The minor premise is to kill John the Baptist would be to kill the innocent. 
This he is taken in part from the senses, because it's his senses which are aware of the individual person, John the Baptist. Finally, there is the conclusion which proceeds both from the intellect and from the senses. Therefore, killing John the Baptist ought not to be done. This is what Herod should have done in his head before acting. Now, what Herod actually did was make use of a bad practical syllogism. His major premise was, whatever my daughter asks ought to be done. This premise is a formulation of what was going on in his appetites. His passions told him, whatever my daughter asked me to do, I ought to do. So this major premise is now replacing the one from his intellect with one from his passions or appetites. Now the minor premise is, my daughter asked that I kill John the Baptist. This is his minor premise, and it's taken from the senses, just like the minor premise in the good practical syllogism. Finally, he draws the conclusion, killing John the Baptist ought to be done. So he draws the wrong conclusion because he has replaced the major premise from the intellect with a major premise from his appetites. He's replaced the moral law with what he, he, his own appetites are inclining him to do. Notice Herod is obviously not totally ignorant of the universal moral law that killing the innocent ought not to be done. He isn't a fool. He knows that moral law habitually, but because of the strength of his desire to please his daughter, he avoids thinking about what he knows, since doing so would get in the way of pleasing his daughter. As we saw before, all sins result from some kind of ignorance a failure to consider what the intellect knows or can know. And here by sin, of course, I mean moral fault, not sin in the technical sense. But only some sins result from the sort of ignorance that we commonly call negligence. This special class of sins is called the sins of ignorance. In sins of ignorance, the moral agent fails to carefully attend to the matters of fact that could influence his practical syllogism by forming its minor premise. For example, an archer may start shooting in the woods without first looking to make sure no one is around. If he accidentally kills someone, he has committed murder through negligence. He didn't want to kill anyone, but did so by failing to inform himself of relevant matters of fact. A famous example of sins of ignorance comes from Oedipus Rex. Oedipus grew up not knowing who his mother was. He later slept with a woman who, at a later time, he found out was his own mother. Had he known this matter of fact, he would never have slept with her. He regretted his action so much that he gouged out his own eyes. The practical syllogism that Oedipus should have used is this. Sleeping with one's mother ought not to be done. That's his major premise, and it's taken from the intellect. His minor premise is, this woman is my mother. This is a minor premise taken from the senses, because it's the senses which are aware of individual things around us. Finally, the conclusion, sleeping with this woman ought not to be done. Oedipus was ignorant of this matter of fact, namely, that this woman is my mother. He was ignorant of this minor premise, but should have endeavored to learn about the woman he was sleeping it with before sleeping with her. Therefore, the action that resulted from his ignorance is the moral fault called incest. No doubt in the future, Oedipus will be more careful to get to know a woman before sleeping with her. Now let's look at sins of malice. The first thing to note about sins of malice is that they need not result from any desire to hurt anyone. Although in English, malice usually denotes ill will towards other people, or being mean or hateful person, these characteristics need not be involved in sins of malice. To commit a sin of malice, one merely needs to do a sinful action for its own sake, that is, because the will itself is inclined to that defective action and takes pleasure in it. 
not bodily pleasure necessarily, but the will itself takes a certain pleasure in the action. So, for example, one who habitually lies in order to please others and make them laugh commits a sin of malice even though he is not a mean or hateful person by any stretch of the imagination. Here it's important to keep in mind that the word malice just comes from the Latin word for bad or evil, so it doesn't necessarily have to mean unkind or mean or harsh or any other sort of thing that might be connoted by the word malice in English. Sins of malice just mean sins that are bad simply speaking because they result from the will's own inclination towards the badness in itself. To understand sins of malice, note that sometimes we do things we know are bad in themselves in order to obtain something better. For instance, if our arm is infected with gangrene, we may willingly allow our arm to be amputated in order to save our own life. We may even amputate our arm ourselves in order to save our life. We judge that living is a greater good than having an arm, and so when these two goods are opposed to one another, we choose the one at the cost of the other. Likewise, we may willingly undergo the low risk of being killed in a car accident in order to drive to work every day, since we judge that the good of working every day far outweighs the unlikely scenario of being killed in a car accident. In sins of malice, the sinner knows full well that what he is doing is sinful but he thinks there is some other good more important than what he loses by sinning, which can only be achieved through sinning. So the sinner is capable of even being conscious of, considering, while acting, that his action is defective, bad, evil, or sinful. Nevertheless, he thinks it's preferable to do this evil thing, to suffer having acted in an evil way, in order to achieve what he considers to be an even greater good. Let's look at the example of the notorious banker Cosimo de' Medici. Cosimo de' Medici knew and accepted the following syllogism, which a moral person would make. Premise 1, and this is the major premise taken from the intellect, making usurious loans ought not to be done. This is a premise taken from the moral law, it's known by the intellect, it's universal in scope. Premise 2, taken from the senses, has to do with particular things, is this. Lending money to this person, in exchange for more than I lent, is making a usurious loan. So, you commit the sin of usury when you lend out money and then expect more in return. The conclusion that a moral person would make, in which... Cosimo de' Medici knew full well is that lending money to this person in exchange for more than I lent ought not to be done. So Cosimo de' Medici knew all of this and could have even been considering it while he engaged in the activity of lending out at interest, that is, of usury. Despite knowing this sound practical syllogism, Cosimo continued to lend money in exchange for profit. That is, he continued to commit the sin of usury. But why? The reason he did so is that he judged that whereas foregoing this practice was good for his eternal salvation, doing it was good for his prosperity on earth. Moreover, he judged that prosperity on earth was more important than eternal salvation. To understand this, Note that every ought statement is implicitly a hypothetical statement of necessity. For instance, driving my car ought to be done in order to get to the store. So the hypothetical necessity is here is that this action is hypothetically necessit necessitated by going to the store. So on the hypothesis that I want to go to the store, I need to drive my car. So there's always a hypothetical necessity in any ought statement, even when we don't express it explicitly. So we might say, killing ought not to be done in order to preserve the common good, or some other hypothesized end, 
Cosimo de' Medici recognized that his usurious loans ought not to be done for the end of his eternal salvation and the justice of society. But he considered his own temporal prosperity in the moment a greater good than his eternal salvation and the justice of society. In other words, there are two practical syllogisms at play in Cosimo de Medici's mind. First, there is the syllogism which he shares with the good man, the person who acts morally. The syllogism is this, making usurious loans ought not to be done for the sake of my eternal salvation and the justice of society. Two, lending money to this person in exchange for more than I lent is making a usurious loan. Three, the conclusion, lending money to this person in exchange for more than I lent ought not to be done for the sake of my eternal salvation and the justice of society. So, even though Cosimo de' Medici has this syllogism in his mind, just like the good man, the difference is that he's not actually pursuing eternal salvation and the justice of society. And since he's not actually pursuing that end, the means which are hypothetically necessitated, namely not giving out usurious loans, are not, uh, are not taken by Cosimo de' Medici, whereas they are taken by the good man. Now, there's a second syllogism that's also in Cosimo de' Medici's mind, and that's the vicious man syllogism. So he's got these two syllogisms at play at the same time. His vicious man syllogism is this. Making you serious loans ought to be done for the sake of my temporal prosperity. Two, lending money to this person in exchange for more than I lent is making a usurious loan. Conclusion, lending money to this person in exchange for more than I lent ought to be done for the sake of my temporal prosperity. Notice that the major premise in the vicious man's practical syllogism is actually from the intellect. It's not something that's false. It's true that, in general, if you give out usurious loans, that will benefit your temporal prosperity. So this, unlike with the syllogism from the weak person, the person who commits a sin of weakness, where the major premise comes from the sense appetites, this major premise is actually coming from the intellect. The intellect truly judges that making usurious loans ought to be done if you want temporal prosperity. The only question is, do you actually prefer temporal prosperity to the justice of society and eternal salvation? If you do, then you'll act like Cosmo de' Medici. You'll give out loans at interest. If you prefer the justice of society and eternal salvation to temporal prosperity, however, you'll go with the first syllogism, the syllogism of the good man. But what's important to note is that in both syllogisms, the major premise comes from the intellect, and Cosmo de' Medici has both syllogisms in his mind at the same time. His choosing to act by the second one rather than the first has to do with his preference for temporal prosperity over eternal salvation and justice. A virtuous person would take that which ought to be done for the sake of justice and eternal salvation as what ought to be done without any qualification. That is, what ought to be done simply speaking. Thus, he would not lend out usurious loans. But since Cosmo had a vice or bad habit, which inclined him to value temporal prosperity above eternal salvation and justice, he took that which ought to be done for temporal prosperity as what ought to be done simply speaking or without qualification. And he took what ought to be done for the sake of eternal salvation and justice as something that could be ignored if it got in the way of temporal prosperity. That's not to say that he was totally against acting for justice. He may very well have done certain things for the sake of justice of society and for the sake of his eternal salvation. It's just that he didn't put these ends above the end of temporal prosperity. So if they got in the way of it, he was willing to sacrifice them, just like someone would be willing to sacrifice their arm to save their life if the arm got in the way of preserving their life. This in no way means that someone will go out of their way to get rid of their arm. Rather, it's just because the arm gets in the way of their life that they may, in certain circumstances, even be willing to cut off their arm. So too, Cosimo de' Medici 
was willing to give up justice in society, willing to give up his eternal salvation for the sake of temporal prosperity when the two came in conflict with each other. That's not to say he didn't want eternal salvation or the justice of society. Now, we've seen that all sins in general, whether they're from weakness, ignorance, or malice, result from both A, the will, as the positive cause, and B, a kind of culpable ignorance, as the cause of the defect in the action. But they result in different ways. Sins of weakness result from, due to a strong passion, ignoring a habitually known moral rule. This causes us to ignore the major premise in the good man syllogism. Sins of ignorance result from failing to carefully consider morally relevant matters of fact before acting. This results in a kind of ignorance or ignoring of the minor premise that a good man would use in acting. Sins of malice result from erroneously judging that some lesser good, such as money, is more valuable than a greater good, justice and eternal salvation. This results from the habit of the will, which inclines it towards a lesser good above a higher good. So, in sins of weakness, the mistake has to do with the major premise. In sins of ignorance, the mistake has to do with the minor premise. In sins of malice, the person recognizes both syllogisms, but values the ends for which the major premise is, uh, is concerned differently. So, one major premise, which he knows, has to do with eternal salvation, or with justice, or charity. The other major premise has to do with something like temporal prosperity. And the person who sins for malice prefers the lower good to the higher good, even though he recognizes the practical syllogism of the good person, equally well to the, good, the syllogism of the vicious person. Someone who commits sins of malice is more abhorrent and hopeless, all else being equal, than one who commits sins through weakness or ignorance. That's because one who sins through weakness or ignorance fails to consider something that they know or could easily know. But one who sins through malice has made a terrible and embarrassing mistake, judging that something obviously less good is more valuable than something obviously more good. The malicious, that is, habitual sinner, has made an error in judgment about the concrete nature of happiness itself. And so, in a way, they are more hopeless than the person who sins through ignorance or weakness, that is, through negligence or through extreme passions.